Good morning and good afternoon, maybe good evening for some of you watching. Uh, my name is Jerry Hulton. Uh, I'm the chairman of the New York Academy of Sciences, uh, former undersecretary of the Navy, and I work primarily in the area of smart cities. So uh, I'm eager to hear this discussion today. We have uh, four of our five panelists on the screen right now are really uh, both diverse geographically and uh, I think in terms of their professions a group and uh, hopefully the uh, fifth member will join as we proceed. So uh, today's topic is uh, essentially about where are we going. Uh, the setups might be that uh, both uh, Ukraine, uh, climate change, COVID are all presenting what seem to be rather uh, major uh, impediments to the sort of beautiful world we might all believe we could create. Uh, these might be called choke points, keeping us from getting to some place we'd really like to be. So the discussion today is about these choke points and getting past these choke points. Uh, with that, uh, let me just briefly uh, introduce the uh, panelists, and I'm pleased to have them here today. Uh, Lauren Smith. Uh, uh, in the United States. Hi, Lauren. Uh, he, very active in uh, both uh, labor policy, transportation policy, and uh, the running of the American government. Uh, I have uh, Ord Levinson, who's in France. Uh, Ord is an artist and a writer and has had a, uh, a really interesting career. And I like having a writer and artist on the panel because it broadens the discussion and gets us into maybe these intuitive insights. Uh, Thomas Polk at a uh, Yale University, uh, ethicist and philosopher, and uh, I think can really help us uh, maybe see what the grounding is of some of these issues and how we get past them. And then Mikhail in Moscow, who uh, uh, has developed the ability to do crowdsourcing for solutions, which I find really intriguing, looking at both looking at the future, but also getting people to participate in building solutions for the future. So that makes a pretty good cross-section of uh, approaches, uh, and I look forward to this discussion. So with that in mind, uh, joke points, how do we get from here? Uh, Lauren, the uh, stage is yours. Well, thanks, Jerry. Uh, I, I, I spent a lot of my time thinking about the supply chain and how, uh, how companies and entrepreneurs and then policymakers are thinking about some of the key challenges there. Um, and uh, and you know, I tend to divide it up into uh, you know, four buckets, so geopolitics, regulation, infrastructure, uh, and then labor issues, workforce issues. Uh, on, on, on geopolitics, I think that you know, some of the major challenges include the, uh, the, uh, the restriction on uh, energy markets and also uh, uh, the uh, food, food sector. I think that uh, there's uh, very serious concerns in a few areas uh, about food shortages and price increases. And I think we can see in different places around the world uh, uh, increased levels of uh, political unrest because of the increase in food costs. I think it is a factor in the, uh, the uh, housing of the uh, Prime Minister in Pakistan uh, last month, and then also in, in Latin America, and uh, I think in, in a few other areas, um, there, there seems to be. Uh, you know, significant and happiness in the U.S. too. You know, increasing food prices. I think that's a big deal. Uh, energy prices. You know, something that you know a lot of people have, have written and talked about. Um, but you know, I'm 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 relatively optimistic over the over the medium medium term and longer term that uh, policymakers you know are, are sort of getting a handle on the importance of the freight network of being able to get goods around, and it's just part of part of a, a global network. And I think even as we sort of move past the sort of like the the, the, the sort of major era of globalization. I don't know if we quite call this new era of post-globalization, but certainly it seems to have changed in some qualitative mm -hmm. way over the past few years. Um, but even with that, you know, the flow of goods around the world as companies adjust is very, very important. And I think that that's part of the geopolitics, but it's also part of uh, are we building infrastructure for a robust freight network? So the you know, freight infrastructure is very important. Regulatory policy, prioritizing the efficient movement of freight is very important. Um, and then ha having having uh, you know workers that can do these jobs uh, and with all the automation technology development is very important. Um, so 
but uh, so I think the supply chain definitely has challenges this year. But you know, over the longer term, I'm I'm optimistic. Uh, but it, it's a it's, it's a big challenge. Hmm. Uh, thank you. Uh, just quickly, uh, do you see uh, this new globalization might have more regional uh, sort of networks? Uh, Africa more as an economy of its own. Do you see this? Uh, well, I think I, I think I think it's, uh, we are entering uh, you know sort of a new era of great power competition. Or I suppose, suppose we're already there, but I think tensions around China are very, are very significant. I think we'll have to see you know China, the U.S. Uh, obviously, uh, obviously the situation uh, in Ukraine with Russia is is a big is, is a big fact to consider. I, I think you know I think there is some regional shifting. Companies looking to leverage risk in certain areas. You have a lot of companies that are like, well, maybe we don't expand our plans in China, or maybe we're shifting to Vietnam or Mexico. I think Mexico and Latin America are, are, are you know, potentially going to see a lot of new manufacturing and industrial activity. And so I think that's, a, I think, I think that's a, you know, something that's good. Good. So Thomas, uh, from your position, uh, one of the leading institutions uh, in the world in education, and you've been at more than one of them. Uh, tell me your thoughts. Well, uh, I think that, that we are in a crisis of globalization. So the the dream of the world where we would all be highly interconnected is probably a dream that is now fading. And so I agree that we will see a more regional uh, retooling of the world economy with uh, just as, as he said. So would you like to uh, uh, take a few moments and tell us your perspective uh, on uh, yeah, sure. where uh, we are headed? I thought I'm number four. But oh, I, I, I moved you. I, I moved you. <laughs> Moderator's prerogative. Oh, That's right. <laughs> Keep you on so your toes. I will talk about food. The UN Food and okay. Agriculture Organization uses four indicators related to undernourishment. And all four of them show increasing incidence in recent years, well before the COVID and Ukraine crisis. Now, I suspect the sustainable development goals are actually to blame. Governments realizing with relief that their outstanding promises have a fulfillment deadline of 2030, too far in the future for any present officials to worry about. On the FAO's narrowest definition, undernourishment has risen by 34% from 615 million in 2015 to 822 million in 2021. This definition includes only those persons whose dietary intake falls below for more than one full year the minimum needed for a sedentary lifestyle. Now, the number of moderately or severely food insecure people is much larger. It's 2.4 billion in 2020, up 44% since 2014. And the FAO's newly introduced number of people unable to afford a healthy diet is given as 3 billion or 42% of all included human beings in 2019. Even this is not a lavish standard. The FAO calculates that a healthy diet can be bought for the purchasing power equivalent of four US dollars per person per day. Again, this is the number for 2019 before COVID struck and before Ukraine. It's a terrible indictment, I think, of our world that even in normal times, 42% of humanity cannot afford a healthy diet costing just 8% of the global average income. Just think of all the children growing up in those impoverished households. Now, since 2019, world food prices have seen an unprecedented spike of 68% due to an unholy combination of climate, COVID, and Ukraine. It is likely that today well over half of all human beings cannot afford a healthy diet and that over a billion are undernourished in the FAO's narrow technical sense. Now, how can food prices be reduced to more normal levels? One immediately important factor already underway is to get those 40 million tons of grain out of Ukraine, ideally by bringing the port of Odessa back into operation. Two other more long-term solutions are to lower meat consumption and food waste. 
both of which involve enormous quantities of food. It's estimated that about one third of all food produced for human consumption goes to waste, and that each kilogram of beef not eaten could free six kilograms of cereals for human consumption. The best immediate solution to the current food price crisis is a reduction in biofuel production. If just the US alone reduced its ethanol production by one third, this would free up 47 million metric tons of corn per year, enough to add 500 kilocalories per day to the diets of 900 million people. Aggregated studies predict that this change alone would likely reduce the global corn price by at least 10% and prices of other intersubstitutable staples by about 7%. Now, unfortunately, worried about the coming midterm elections, the Biden administration has decided to do the opposite, to increase biofuel production. This will please farmers, but it will invariably aggravate the global food price crisis. So food or fuel, this is... Um. My tough question. And uh, do you see places where uh, someone's actually making a move on the positive direction of what you've described? No, I've talked to a number of food experts. They all are worried about the food crisis, which is really bigger than the 2008 to 2011, you know, when we had the Arab Spring and all these riots and so on. But uh, really nobody has have focused on uh, biofuels. And biofuels is the one thing that has the two properties of being immediately doable and large. We need something large to dampen prices. There's, of course, a lot of speculation. People think that they can make a big buck by buying future contracts on grains. And to dampen speculation, I think this would be a, a big market signal to say we will cut biofuel production by a third. And of course, not just the US, this should be done in concert with Indonesia, with Brazil, with Germany, and so on, in order really to have an effect. Let's come back to uh, that, because it seemed to be at least the other question, which is if you reduce biofuel production, the substitution for fuel uh, either goes to uh, 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 oil and gas, uh, and that's, of course, been a thing that everyone's been trying to avoid, too. So we'll return to that. So, or uh, here you are as an artist and a writer. You get the, maybe the luxury of a slightly more intuitive view of the world. Uh, these choke points, these tough futures we face, uh, tell us your thoughts. Thank you, Jerry. Thanks uh, so far. Uh, I'm going to uh, read this in a way. So Gertrude Stein on her deathbed exclaimed, what is the answer? What is the answer? She then sat bolt upright. What is the question? She cried. She fell back and died. Where are we at? Mankind as machine, unkind, unfeeling, self-obsessed, like the men of Picasso's Mexican career. Putin's Z truth, Z as in Katzet, has shown us a blemished world, a world of unkindness, but it's everywhere. China's Uyghurs, Modi's Muslims, the Tamadu in Burma, summary executions, rape, displacement, confinement, arbitrary arrest, deportation on every continent. Hunger, the abortion war erupting in the USA, Brexit, Oban in Hungary, endlessness. And let's not forget the climate. That catastrophe needs no human to push the button anymore. Where are we going? Each believe they have the answer, the way forward, but based on what? The Roman times were also times of religious prostitution, brutality, and pragmatism. Only today we live longer. And the world muddy long, muddles along with a solution. It feels different now. Bigger sticks, nuclear, international trade, info war, social network, mental abuse, post-truth, and again, climate. What appears to be certain in human and what appears to be certain is human unkindness extends even to nature. The way, nothing is certain, I believe. We plan, things change, we adapt, things get better. Who remembers the millennium bug, the end of the EU with Brexit? No one now talks of Brexit or Brexit. And is it all bad? 
After all, the unity in the EU has never been so strong. Britain is no longer Brexiting, but trundling around to be part of Europe, signing defence treaties with Sweden and Finland. Where we have been is to find certain solutions to the exterior events like COVID, putting in Z troops, China's ambitions, delivery, climate. It's a path well trodden based on exterior mentality. Will it end in war or destruction is a non-starter question. It has all sorts. Unkindness predominates. Did not our world vision change from an exterior mentality to an interior mentality some hundred years ago with Buddhism? Not problem solving, but looking for the essential. The vision of the public is simply that, and it's revolutionary. Essentials, basics, food, housing, freedom, authenticity, own a living. Glimmers of kindness. These are also the characteristics of the artist Zelensky. He's in an internal moral sense of justice and the courage to carry it out in the way he, in all the ways he is. The attempt to break the choke, hook, the choke point flutters everywhere. So do the bullies chant of unkindness, the attack to us or die. Exterior, ment exterior mentality is a blurred vision of external appearance, one-eyed, like Rembrandt's surveillance. It's a simple reality, not a conceptual reality. The latter, which is built on lived experience, observation as to what lies beneath the surface, essence. What is the human essence? In autistic terms, it is a search for beauty, not for knowledge. It is a philosophy I call conceptual realism. We cannot plan long term for the aftermath of defining moments like Putin's Z troops and their deployment or Roe versus Wade being overturned. I hope we can muddle along the universal change of vision, but I fear not. But then perhaps to quote Keats, my confusion and uncertainty of the way forward is negative capability, dealing uncertainties, mysteries, doubts without any irritable reaching of the fact and reason. I'm not optimistic, as one should not underrate the ingenuity of the unkind fool or the certainty of John. I began with a writer, I end with one. In nature, there's no blemish but the mind. None can be called deformed but the unkind. That's Shakespeare. To me, that is a tough question. How can kindness replace what we have now? Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Uh, at least I'd have you think about this when we get to the uh, discussion. Uh, it seems as though the world needs a narrative that uh, has the view that humans can live in a kindest world, as you describe. Because uh, I think there's a lot of view that this is sort of the way humans end up. Uh, so I'd be interested to see your thoughts on narrative and what's the story that needs to be told uh, that gets the world to see the things you described. So with that, uh, Mikhail, I suspect you're kind of thinking I'm ready to talk because you've, uh, you've worked on solutions uh, and a way to find solutions and to develop them from crowdsourcing, I find very intriguing. So uh, I'd love to hear what you have to say about what we've already heard, which is uh, sort of, uh, there's definitely choke points, there's definitely unsolved problems. Uh, talk to us a little bit about solutions. Uh, uh, well, first of all, I'd like uh, to point out that our role uh, and my role, the role of the found of Carlson Agency is not to find the solution, but to ask questions. So maybe our activity is very much linked to the topic of um, <clears throat> this panel. We ask questions to the crowd, to the community of volunteer experts and supporters of different companies or different projects. And we ask them to think about possible solutions. Or maybe we ask them to think about um, <coughs> hidden risks and hidden threats and how to prevent uh, the appearance of these hidden risks and hidden uh, threats. So our role are more close to the role of uh, mentor or coach. Uh, but uh, uh, saying that, I will try to share my own view about maybe the main uh, threat and the main problem which we are facing with today. I think that it is the decrease of the value of the human life. I think it's maybe more philosophical issue than rational issue, but I think that the <coughs> main uh, problems we are facing now, uh, COVID pandemic and war between Russia and Ukraine is very much linked. 
without pandemic, most likely uh, it will be no war. Because the pandemic uh, leads uh, to uh, the decrease of the value of the human life. Also, the pandemic uh, uh, leads to isolation of different countries. So uh, people do not feel themselves as the part of humanity. They started to feel themselves, first of all, as Russian or Chinese or Indian or Americans rather than human beings. I think that probably it is one of the most serious uh, challenges we are facing now uh, because the values have changed and the the most the, the main tough question is how to uh, return to values we had maybe 10 20 30 years ago because today values are more close to the values of 19th century than values of 21st century because of different reasons, because of some politicians, because of uh, epidemics, because of other reasons, but it is the main uh, challenge we are trying to face with and to, to solve it. And we don't know the clear answer yet, in my opinion, but crowd intelligence or crowdsourcing of solutions, as you, may, uh, as you mentioned, uh, could be one of the things, because if you create a big diversified community, it consists not only of, of five panelists, but maybe of 500, 5,000 uh, people of different nationalities with different uh, life experience, uh, worried about the situation or maybe about uh, other issues, and very high motivated to find the solution, it is very high chances that at least one of these 500 to 5,000 will find non-standard and very efficient solutions to these issues. Do you... Uh, <clears throat> so I understand the, uh, the method and what you're doing, which congratulations. Uh, are there solutions you're seeing that uh, you think deserve more attention uh, as you do this work? Uh, well, I think that well, crowd intelligence works in the situation when solutions are non-standard. Because so, if you don't have knowledge how to solve this or that problem, it might be business problem, it might be social problem, it might be scientific problem. So when you use, uh, need to use not knowledge, but imagination and creativity of different people with different life experience, different professional experience, then you can create the community of these people. You can ask each member of the community to think about these issues, give them enough time, maybe several days or several weeks, or several months, depends on the uh, problem or issue you need to solve. And after that, you will receive a lot of different solutions, a, diff a lot of different variants of solutions. Mm -hmm. And in this case, we're faced with another problem, how to uh, uh, select the best solution. But if you have not one solution to the very complicated problem, but several solutions, you will have more chances that among these several solutions, one of them is Genius solutions, very efficient solutions, and usual solutions, creative solutions. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, I, uh, uh, Kale and I have been trading uh, information offline because I'm intrigued with this. So we'll, I won't, I won't go into more detail now. But I'm, I'm continuing to be intrigued with what you're doing. So, yeah. uh, so I think uh, now as a group, uh, I think I picked up one thing. Uh, that uh, comes close to showing up in everyone's discussion, and that is this issue of valuing human life. Uh, the uh, uh, if you read Kim Stanley Robinson's book, uh, Ministry for the Future, you know the premise is that you needed a ministry to value the future lives of, let's say, children today, adults in 2050, uh, as a methodology. But let's talk a little more about. Uh, this 
problem of valuing uh, human life. Uh, you know, the transportation industry, Lauren, has uh, for a long time had a, a value on human life. It relates to how they design highways and safety, et cetera. Uh, can, we, can we take this and push it a little further in terms of how we get to like the food question that uh, Thomas raised or to raise the bigger question of uh, how humans behave, <clears throat> the chaos looking for solutions. So Lauren, well, talk a little so, bit about how transportation handled this. Sure, yeah, so, so uh, when you think about transportation, you have different uh, new technologies and new infrastructure that you can put into different projects. You mentioned roads, uh, also vehicle design. There's lots of things that you can do to <clears throat> affect the way the vehicle operates, make it more efficient, make it faster, make it safer. And all of these things, you know, have, uh, you have to do a cost benefit analysis. And so, you know, in, in some sense, you have to have some way of saying, well, how do we quantify what it means if, um, I mean, should we spend a, should we, should we implement a new regulation that will cost $10 billion if it shows that, you know, that the, uh, the, the statistical change in road safety is very small. Well, that, what you call a small change is still someone's life, but you know, can we still, you know, how should we think about the uh, the cost benefit analysis for that? And so that, that's that's typically what's meant in transportation. I think uh, one of the ways I'm very optimistic is I think um, that I think that a lot of the new technologies uh, are going to have uh, substantial new challenges. You know, that we're going to have to deal with in terms of uh, different societal norms around. Know, surveillance and privacy and uh, you know who owns the data uh, I think th th those are all going to be very very significant issues um, but it's uh, it, it will also help us bring down uh, the number of fatalities on the road so we're gonna have vehicles that do uh, crash avoidance uh, we focus on crash survivability uh, crash worthiness uh, has been sort of the metric over the last 50 or 60 years can we make the vehicle more crash worthy if you get into a crash um, how do we make sure that you're going to be able to walk away from it uh, or increase your odds of walking, um, and uh, and now there's more of a focus on uh, crash avoidance. Like what if the vehicle has sensors on it, and it's so smart that it can help you as the driver do a better job of doing your job of driving the car, uh, or eventually maybe the vehicle will be doing all the driving itself. We have a fully autonomous vehicle, but in either case, we have vehicles that are better and better equipped to avoid accidents in the first place. And so those technologies, I think that does all, you know, it's part of the part of the excitement around autonomous vehicles is not only could it make things more efficient, you know, you potentially have beneficial impacts to the environment, uh, but you reduce the number of crashes. So that's sort of one example of technology improvements. Yeah. Uh, with better materials, better materials for roadways, better designs for the sides. Um, but in all of that, you do have to have some sort of way that you quantify like, well, if we think that doing this, this type of change will save you know, 50 lives, you know, we'll knock 50 lives off of the 40,000 lives just in the U.S. It's more than a million globally, yeah. uh, but more than 40,000 yeah. lives lost. Uh, this this change will knock 50 lives off of that number on a statistical broad average basis. But this change can save 250 lives or 2000 lives. Well, hey, that's that's where the that's where the big money is. Yeah. And so it's um it's 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 a tricky thing, you know, and uh, and, you know, when I worked in government, uh, it was sort of one of those things where, you know, we're like, wait, are you putting a price in human life? Like, well, no, no. Well, maybe a little. <laughs> yes, a little. That's but but, I, but I, I, I very much associate myself with the statements by the other panel. You guys are, I, I, I really appreciate it. I, I feel like the cold uh, economist uh, guy, like, you know, the energy network and the freight network. And then, you know, with Ord, I'm like, we should be having cigarettes uh, in Paris at a nice cafe with some nice coffee. And, you know, maybe some Thank maybe you. Some Ord, set that up for us, okay? Uh, and I think, uh, Lauren, the other thing that's intrigued me, I'm beginning to see this uh, a near miss or near accident analysis begins to not only ask when accidents happen, analyze the problem, but also begin to study the almost accidents and design intersections and highways to avoid the almost accidents, which, uh, which are harder to count. But they're out there. But uh, so, Thomas, uh, so here we have transportation, which to some extent has quantified this cost benefit uh, mm -hmm. fairly precisely. I think Lauren would argue probably there's some slippage here and there in how it works, but margin of error, to, Jerry. Margin of error, thank you. And but in the in terms of an issue like food, 
we don't even seem to have a way to quantify the uh, damage. I mean, we 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 have either massive numbers, which are almost unmanageable, but we don't have a kind of close, tight system of food production efficiency that matches what uh, Lauren just described in transportation. So in France, a- I think it's within reach. I think the problem, the big problem is that we are not willing to do what Lauren just uh, simply took for granted, namely assign equal value to the lives of all human beings. You know, one of the things that makes this hunger crisis so incredibly shocking is that at very low cost, $4 per person per day, we could increase the number of people who have a healthy diet. And we are just not doing it because we are saying it's not worth it. This is not, you know, it's not something that's important enough. Of course, with regard to uh, people in the United States, we would say it is worth it, $4 per person per day, and we would do it, and we would give out food stamps and so on. But in many regards, even in the United States, we implicitly value the lives of different people differentially. So let me give an example, right? Pharmaceutical research. Pharmaceutical research is rewarded by monopoly patents, and the patents, uh, the income from the patent, depend on how much potential users of a medicine are willing and able to pay. And so if a disease is common among wealthy people, then it gets a lot of research and development attention from pharmaceutical companies. If it's malaria or tuberculosis or schistosomiasis or something unpronounceable, then uh, it will get very little attention, even though the damage that could be averted by having a new drug in that area is vastly greater than the damage that you could avert by having yet another statin on the market or yet another remedy for diabetes. Yeah, and it seemed to be uh, put, worth put went on a list of things to think about, not necessarily answer today. Is well, why transportation gets this rather precise analysis, and other issues uh, get such a vague analysis? Because uh, mm-hmm. I think if if the whole world operated as the transportation model worked, we'd probably say that's a fairly efficient, uh, successful world. Uh, well, so, uh, uh, or uh, why don't you talk a little bit about uh, Sorry? the role of a, as a writer and an artist, talk a little bit about uh, how you, how do you sort of pull in together data and then how do you turn it into something that's uh it has an impact on others. I mean, let's take Picasso. He he does Gornica, and we sort of say, yeah, that really resonates with me. How, how's that? What's what's the current artistic mode that's going to tell that story to the world, have the world <clears throat> pay more attention to these problems? I, I, I think what is really important, as, as I've mentioned, is not these... Um, the externals, when I consider, they're very useful and they will solve things in the short run, perhaps. But we will get whatever we're having from the climate to uh, Putin's war to uh, again and again. It will just get worse. And from what Thomas said, uh, which I hadn't realized, things have got a lot worse in terms of the hunger. But the, the, to answer your question, I think there has to be an emotional experience, a lived experience that someone has had that they want to transmit. Zelensky, when he addressed the uh, cinema, he said he talked about the great dictator and he said there would have to be more. And he's right. There are more films about that. You, uh, some of you may have watched the, um, the, the poor, if I can call him a poor, uh, 21-year-old uh, up on uh, crimes against, uh, well, crimes against humanity in, in Kiev. He admits his guilt. He doesn't say I was obeying orders and confronted by the, um, the, the, the wife of the person whom he shot in cold blood. And uh, she said, well, who's going to look after me? I suppose my, my reaction as an artist would be, if he had turned around perhaps then and said, I will, that would have been a very emotive and meaningful um, situation for, for an artist to convey and, and realize that these people who have, there's no point in locking him up to life. It's, it's, it's a useless uh, punitive action which will not solve anything, I don't think. So I think if that has answered your question, he's, Picasso's better work, I think, than Guernica, or different, at least, is Massacre in Korea, which has these um, 
the man on the on the extreme right of the painting is uh, with a sword, and as they progress towards the left of the painting, which is uh, a pregnant woman all nude, a child, uh, a barren landscape, the the arms of these people become more metallic and more inhuman and more um, without feeling. So I don't believe any great art is created out any uh, lived emotion and lived experience and based on a feeling. And uh, what will come out of the whole situation, I don't know. Certainly, I, you know, uh, as far as hunger is concerned, one's seen some photographs of um, pretty grim animals and starving, and one reads about birds falling out of the sky in India because of climate change, because they had the, the, the heat exhaustion and no food. These are the things that have to be communicated as to what is happening and to move people to change, but it's an internal change. It's not going to be come from an external change. We'll, we'll paper over the cracks, I think, unfortunately, or fortunately, but it will not work. If other ones you, uh, uh, and I'll pose it, but it's probably you don't have time to answer it because I'm watching the clock here. Uh, it almost feels at times like there's a waiting for the arrival of a new uh, prophet or a messiah who says there's a worldview that all the world could accept because okay, so we've got these divisive worldviews christianity islam uh korean uh, i mean uh, buddhism we haven't found a unifying vision well i i thought only of one thing recently and i thought of a, a, a provisional slogan called un undamaged or un damage because we all okay. damage we all we all damage i believe we all have have been damaged okay. And how maybe that is something Mikhail can put forward to his uh, his group as to what, what is the way that one can undamage yeah. what is damaged. I don't know. So, Mikhail, are are you able to uh, get people around the world to in, engage in a problem solution? And uh, if so, again, are there certain themes that you're beginning to pick up that you think could be unifying themes? Yes, well, I think that uh, not only me, but uh, other people and other companies uh, are able to uh, unite people all over the world in uh, joint uh, creation and uh, joint uh, findings for different important solutions to the most complicated vital problems. <laughs> so, uh, well, for instance, our agency is not only agency or only company in the world for trying to use crowd intelligence and finding solutions to different problems. Just for instance, NASA uh, uh, in the past used crowdsourcing in uh, uh, order to find uh, different solutions, how to help astronauts, how to explore space and so on. So crowdsourcing is used in scientific area, Crowdsourcing is uh, used in a social area. We're just trying to use crowdsourcing as a permanent tool helping different companies, different regions, different cities, and different countries, maybe, not only to solve some specific uh, problem, but to develop, to yeah. achieve their strategic goals. So we are trying to build long-term crowdsourcing projects. Good. Not sure. short term, but long term. But uh, it's, I think it's one of the general trends in the, to use crowd intelligence in combination probably with artificial intelligence uh, to solve the most uh, important uh, issues uh, for different companies and for whole humanity. It's interesting if you go back to Ord's comment on uh, Picasso, this, this is a different picture of the human behavior uh, worth uh, kind of hanging on to, this ability to pull out the best of people. Uh, we're down to the five minute countdown and Lauren's warned us at the end of five minutes, it's uh, Cinderella time and it's over. So uh, for each of you, uh, I'd recommend you know a 15 second, 30 second, uh, statement of, well, based on what we've talked about today, uh, what sort of the burning comment you want to make about uh, where we head? 
And I'll take the order we went in in the beginning. So, uh, Lauren, I'll let you leave the way. And then uh, I'll work our way around the circle. Well, thanks, Jerry. Uh, I'll just, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm optimistic uh, that uh, entrepreneurship and technology are going to solve a lot of the problems that we're seeing now. I think in the short term, uh, I am fairly pessimistic. I think the next year or two are going to be um, uh, fairly difficult uh, in terms of supply chain, food uh, food issues, shortages, and, 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 and uh, uh, high prices are going to be a problem. Energy is going to be a problem. Uh, I, I'm optimistic that over the next couple of years we're going to fix this. Yeah. And I think, uh, I think that entrepreneurship is going to be very important. I think new technologies will be very important. I, um, I think uh, I think hopefully policymakers are, are, are I think they're starting to, to uh, wake up to this as well, and uh, but that's uh, that's my view. Good, good, Thomas. So, I'm optimistic about solutions. I think we have solutions. The difficulty often is implementing these solutions, getting people united behind them. And here, one issue that we didn't talk about that falls a bit into Jerry's domain is the issue of national security of trust. We have competing nation states, and these nation states very jealously uh, guard their power potential in a competitive world. And they are very reluctant to do anything moral, even if it is a good thing and a clear cut, very nice solution, if it favors their rivals a little bit more than it favors themselves. And I see that as a big roadblock. Yeah. Thank you. Ord? Well, I'm unlike the two former speakers, very pessimistic, uh, both short term and uh, because I think things will, will get worse and we won't get better. Um, I, I think what I'd like to try and do, maybe in the, the time scales you mentioned originally of 18 months, is try and find some sort of way, but using what uh, uh, Lauren said about technology and entrepreneurship, about trying to find a, a way of uh, telling a story that can change and uh, and develop um, and not just because people won't necessarily look at art or anything like that so that's what i'm going to try and uh, amongst other things that i'm doing is try to find something uh, that can be uh, can be a positive link good well let's, let's the two of you build a bridge i, I yeah. like that i think cigarettes in paris is the answer so uh mikhail okay. get the closing words uh well uh, uh i would say that i'm not optimistic and not pessimistic. I think that still human civilization have different scenarios. And the final choice is not made. So maybe the future will be better than today. Maybe it will be worse. It depends on answers, which we will find for tough questions. And also I agree that it depends on the quality of implementation of the solutions to will find. Yeah. Well, uh, I've really enjoyed this discussion. Uh, I think uh, uh, it's it's been very helpful to me because I worry about the same issues and uh, work on the same issues, uh, especially what the Lauren described. I've been a technology person for my whole life. So uh, let's digest this. At least the f four of us, I miss Jacob, but the four of us are good friends now. And let's uh, Keep pursuing this each in our way and maybe together too with uh, cigarettes in Paris. <laughs> See everybody. Well, maybe All right. You're welcome. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye.